question for the 70s. Can man survive? Here's one answer from Eugene Jensen of the Federal Office of Water Quality. I'm completely convinced that they can as far as water is concerned. I think we've passed the bottom point that we have most of the technology that we need to have to deal with a great majority of our industrial waste. We know how to handle our municipal waste and can retreat them to the point we can drink them if we want to or need to. And I think the outlook for mankind, at least on that score, is real favorable. But not everyone is quite as optimistic about our water as is Director Jensen. Water and Man will be the subject of this report produced by Walter McGraw for Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, with Dr. Harry Shapiro of the American Museum of Natural History as consultant. I'm Gary Moore. And here is the chairman of the Scientist Institute for Public Information, Professor Barry Commoner. The purity of water that's available to us in lakes and rivers is the result of the activity of living systems. And there is what's called an ecological cycle that goes on in lakes and rivers. For example, if you start, uh, let's say, with a fish, fish is made up of chemicals of the sort that we call organic, complex carbon-containing molecules. Uh, when the fish dies, or for that matter, when it releases its waste, this kind of organic matter is released into the water. Immediately, any organic matter of that sort in the water is attacked by another group of living organisms, uh, bacteria, the bacteria of decay. And they convert the organic matter into inorganic matter. So, for example, the fish protein, which is organic, is converted ultimately to nitrate, to carbon dioxide and phosphate. Uh, and so organic matter is converted generally to inorganic matter. Now this inorganic matter becomes uh, the nutrition for another group of organisms, now the green plants, the algae. And they take up the carbon dioxide, the nitrate, the phosphate, and reconvert it to organic matter, the organic matter of the algae. And then the small fish may come along and eat the algae and convert its organic matter into fish organic matter, the small fish may be eaten by the big one, and we're back where we started from. Now, you see at once that this is a cycle, and it's clear that the operation of the cycle is what keeps the organic content of the water down. So, for example, the bacteria decay work very quickly. Now, in order to do that, they need oxygen. Uh, the oxygen comes in from the air and is also produced by the green plant. And this exemplifies one of the simple laws of ecology, which is that uh, everything is connected to everything else. Now, to see how this is influenced by the way in which we operate in the environment, uh, let's consider uh, what would happen if we add our own organic matter, sewage, to the water. Now, if you add more organic matter to this system, at first it will simply go faster. You'll get more inorganic matter, more algae, more fish, and the wheel will simply turn faster. But if you add still more organic matter, you may get to the point where the bacteria of decay, which use oxygen as they break down the organic matter, run out of oxygen. Now, in effect, they have so much organic matter that in order to combine it with oxygen sufficiently, they use up all the oxygen in the water. At that point, the bacteria die because they need oxygen to survive, and that step in the cycle halts and as a result, the cycle as a whole breaks down. And so here's an example of how a stress placed on an environmental system of this sort will literally break it down and stop the self-purifying activities in the water. So we are literally causing pollution by overdriving these ecological systems. It's been calculated that by 1980, we will be dumping so much organic matter into surface waters as to require the use of all of the oxygen in all the surface waters of the United States during the summer months. Now, of course, this won't happen evenly everywhere, but it gives you the idea that what we can do as human beings is so intense as to match the capacity of the entire ecological system in our country. Now, of course, in many places this has already happened, as in Lake Erie. We've been told that Lake Erie is dead. 
But Grover Cook, who was director of enforcement for the Federal Water Administration in the Chicago area, puts it another way. Actually, Lake Erie is not dead. Lake Erie is too full of life. The problem in Lake Erie is over-fertilization by human sewage, which results in a luxurious growth of plant life called algae in the western end. There are actually three basins in Lake Erie. The western basin, central and eastern. The western basin is very shallow and the algae grows so profusely that it is not usable for anything hardly except to grow fish. And unfortunately, the desirable kinds of fish are not living there anymore. It's mostly the carp and catfish type sucker of where they used to have walleye pike and that sort of thing. Now, human sewage contains liberal amounts of fertilizer, but the advent of synthetic detergents has done more to cause pollution problems in this country than any other one single thing, except the population boom. Approximately 55%, admittedly by the industry, up to 70% that we say of the phosphorus in sewage is from synthetic detergents. This has been the real culprit in the deterioration of Lake Erie. But uh, actually, Lake Erie is not that big a concern. If you put a drop of water into the Detroit River, which is the entrance to Lake Erie, theoretically, if it behaved like all other molecules of water in Lake Erie, it would take three years for it to reach Niagara Falls. Both through time in Lake Erie is only three years. Lake Ontario is in worse shape than Lake Erie is. This has not been brought to the public attention, but there is a much greater problem in Lake Ontario because it's deeper, there's much more water, and the flow through time is much greater than Lake Erie. The biggest problem in the Great Lakes is Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan, if it continues to become polluted, would be a very serious situation because the flow through time in Lake Michigan is 1,000 years. Detergent companies have instituted vast programs to discover cleaning products with less phosphates, and they seem to have had little success so far. Meanwhile, environmentalists are urging housewives to use soaps like Lux or Ivory Snow instead of detergents. And our cities are being pressed to do something about their sewers. Over 1,400 cities still are dumping raw sewage into their freshwater sources. Few sewage systems are adequate. Why? Again, Director of Operations of the U.S. Office of Water Quality, Eugene Jensen. I think it was largely a series of accidental developments that goes all the way back to when we first started to have pressure water systems that made water in large quantities available to every house in a large city. As long as your water supply was limited, if you had to go out to the pump at the corner of the block and bring home two buckets of water, you were going to be rather conservative in your use of it. But with our pressure water systems, it made it possible for us to develop something that we're calling water carriage sewage. That is, sewage is carried by water, and the water uh, really is simply the, the transporting vehicle through these pipelines that we like to call sewers. So we've used the sewers simply as a way of transporting our human waste and industrial waste from one point where they're a nuisance to us to some other point where they're a nuisance to someone else. It's been something that we slipped into really without ever realizing that it was happening to us until our city started to get so close together. Our water supply intakes and our industrial water intakes began to run into the waste that were coming down from the city above them or the city next to them. Because it's been a sort of an accidental development that no one ever really thought about. It. It's a failure in systems analysis. Only those terms hadn't been invented. In our municipal waste systems, we have the technology right now that would permit us to restore the water back so you could drink it safely as it came out of the plant. Professor Commoner doesn't feel that this is enough even if more than just 10 of our cities had it. Well, some people think that you can uh, beat the rat, so to speak. So we develop a technology to uh, stop the input of organic matter into surface water. 
sewage treatment. Instead of allowing the uh, organic matter or sewage to go in directly, we have it go into a treatment plant. And in the treatment plant, bacteria of decay operate, convert the organic matter to inorganic matter, and we give them extra air so that they don't run out of oxygen. And then the treatment plant produces inorganic material, which we then allow to go into rivers and lakes, in the expectation that all will be well, that we go out to sea. Well, it doesn't work that way. Because when you have extra nutrients for the algae, and that's what the inorganic materials are, the algae grow very fast. Now, whenever you get a heavy overgrowth of algae, they also die fast. When they die, they release their organic matter to the water. Now the bacteria of decay are again overwhelmed, and the cycle breaks down. So you can't get around the cycle by short-circuiting in this way. The solution is to examine the natural path that organic matter, uh, that organic waste, take in nature. In effect, the people of this country are living off organic matter produced mainly in the soil of the United States. And clearly, the organic matter that we produce as a result of that, sewage, belongs back on the soil. Otherwise, the soil will be deprived of its nutrients, while surface waters will be overstressed by excess organic matter. And so it's perfectly clear that the way to handle this is to take the total organic matter of sewage and garbage for that matter and see that it gets back to the soil. Now, that's not what we do now. Uh, instead, we attempt to get rid of sewage by using surface waters. Part of the residue in sewage treatment plant sludge is sometimes burned, which simply disseminates pollutants into the air. Garbage, which is mostly organic matter, belongs back in the soil. Instead, we usually incinerate it or dump it in places where it can't decay properly and be accommodated into the soil system. In other words, we have got to restore whatever we take from the cycle back to its proper place in the cycle. And we are not doing that. Our technology breaks the cycle and disrupts it and therefore causes pollution. And to my mind, the important thing about pollution is not merely that it's a nuisance or a threat to health, both of which are true, but that it's a signal that our technology is beginning to break down the integrity of the environmental systems that support us. Our technology can make dried fertilizer from sewer sludge, but chemical fertilizers are cheaper, which brings us to the agricultural pollution of our water. Director Jensen. There are a series of agricultural or land pollution. The worst one of them, I suppose, is of a very hard pesticide, the agricultural chemicals. They tend to remain with us forever. They tend to be reaccumulated through the food chains and to cause tremendous damage to fish and wildlife, which in turn, I suppose, eventually will affect people. It almost has to. The only real control for pesticides of that kind, I think, will be to go the prescription drug route and to not use them except in those circumstances where their use is absolutely necessary and then to control their use very, very tightly. There are other types of pesticides and herbicides and chemicals which probably are safe to use provided they're used properly. We're going to have to, as a nation and as a world, I think, come up with some kind of rules and regulations about how these are going to be used so that the farmer doesn't over-apply fertilizers and so that he doesn't uh, apply them in such a way that they're immediately washed off into the streams that drains his property. Sediments are another uh, big source of pollution, and they come, of course, from our farms. Some of them simply are a result of geological erosion. There's nothing much you can do about that. And they come from the construction of our urban areas. They come from construction of our highways. We know how to control sedimentation from these. It's simply a matter of applying the proper kind of ordinances and uh, telling the builder he must apply good control methods. Sediments in the streams tend to get themselves all mixed up with some of the other industrial pollutants that come in. They cause turbidity in the water. They make it generally unappealing for swimming. They limit its use for fish life. They silt up boat harbors and they silt up oyster beds and, and fish spawning grounds. So sediments can cause a lot of damages.
Another one of these problem areas that's closely related is this salinity, the return flow from irrigation in the west. When we apply water to the irrigated fields, it percolates through the ground, picks up salts and nutrients, and these in turn are carried into the receiving waters. And as the stream is used and reused as it moves down towards the ocean, it becomes much, much saltier than when it originally started in the mountains. So salty, in fact, that down towards the end of some of our big rivers, they really can't be used for irrigation anymore. So if we're going to control that, we're going to have to come up with control measures on irrigation. We're going to have to seek better irrigation methods, spray irrigation, better drainage ditches, systems for the removal of salinity and nutrients from these return flows. And another area in agriculture is this matter of feedlots. Agriculture used to be a small farm type operation. There were no really great concentrations of animals anywhere. Now a very large percentage of our hogs, our, our cattle, dairy farms, poultry production plants are, are really almost sort of an agri-industry. Thousands and thousands of head of cattle or hogs or poultry concentrated in just one place. And the waste from these animals are just exactly the same as the waste from our large cities. If we don't provide adequate treatment, they simply cause enormous pollution problems in the areas that receive them. Fortunately, I think that uh, this problem can be handled rather easily because most of the feedlots are located in relatively rural areas and there are big land areas that can, if we do it right, be used to treat the waste that are produced in these concentrated feeding operations. But it's a new problem and we're sort of slipping into it by accident. We hadn't realized there was going to be a problem there when we started. We seem prone lately to run into unpleasant accidents. Kevin Shea, the scientific director of the magazine Environment, help bring one of these unpleasant surprises to our attention. Mercury is the pollutant that's causing the most concern right now. It should be because it's an extremely dangerous material. It causes various kinds of nervous disorders. Uh, Low-level poisoning, one might observe uh, agitation and the individual may have headaches and a whole range of neural disorders. That's one that the should not have, but did sneak up on us and caught us with our data down, so to speak. The Japanese have a very bad experience with, with mercury poisoning. The Swedes had some experience with mercury poisoning in the early 60s, and we should have been aware of this, but we just were not ready for it. We should have been. We've been using mercury seed coatings in agriculture for years and years. We have been using mercury in pulp mills as a fungicide for years. We've been using mercury in the production of chlorine gas for a long time. I mean, we had all of the sources from which mercury could come, uh, and yet we were not ready for this problem when it finally arrived. And I think it arrived only because we discovered it. Uh, it's probably been with us longer than we know. Our magazine, Environment, I think, published the first series of articles uh, on the situation. Oh, and probably we were responsible for getting this interest moving in this country so that we could find out what was going on. Even though industry is a large user of our municipal sewers, over and above that, it still directly discharges 60% of the pollutants to be found in our waters. Now, how many of these are dangerous? Again, Director Kessler. All of the heavy metals, lead, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, can all serve as pollutants if they're present in large enough quantities. And most of them can be picked up and come back to us through the food chain. For example, oysters in some of our coastal areas can pick up, oh, as much as 5,000 parts per million of zinc or copper from waters that apparently are very low in these metals. They simply have an enormous ability to reconcentrate these metals, and this shows up then all through our food chain. Well, other pollutants that are going into our surface waters are all of the materials that one way or another exert a demand for oxygen. There are all of the, the sediments. There are a great number of organic chemicals of one kind or another, I suppose thousands of organic chemicals. There's heat, which is a pollutant in its own right. There's all sorts of uh, microbiological pollutants, bacteria, viruses, the eggs of various uh, intestinal parasites. 
the almost unlimited number of pollutants of one kind or another. Color is another one, for example. Color may not really uh, cause much of any damage, even if it gets into a water supply, but it may be a very visible sort of a pollutant, something that, that may make the public think the stream is much more polluted than it really is. David Dominic is the acting administrator of the Office of Water Quality. We have the technology to take care of specific kinds of pollution. We have the technology to take care of domestic sewage. We have most of the technology in hand to take care of industrial pollution. We don't have sufficient cost-effective technology to take care of some of the more diffuse sources of pollution, non-point sources such as agricultural runoff. In the municipal area, our best estimate today is that it will require about $10 billion, federal, state, and local, to just bring us up current with water quality standards as they now exist over the next five years. It'll cost us $10 billion to catch up with the backlog, and the backlog, I think, could be most conveniently defined as the 50 years of neglect catch up with the backlog and then to keep us current with existing demand, uh, say, by the year 1975. $10 billion will take care of the pollution from municipal sources. It will not take care of pollution from other sources, such as industrial, such as agricultural, such as acid mine drainage, such as stormwater overflows, and things like this. You have got to clean up all sources of pollution if you're going to reach acceptable levels of water quality. I think that the industry too often in the past has uh, waged uh, its pollution fight in the public relations department instead of in the engineering department. We know that industries contribute very significant loads of pollutants, and we know that is a most significant, perhaps the most significant source of pollutants in our waters today. We don't have firm fixes on the cost to industry to clean up those pollution discharges. I have the feeling that uh, those costs will not be as great as they are in the public sector, in the municipal sector, uh, for a number of reasons. And the principal reason is that once we tell the industry what they have to do, uh, they are going to come up with cost-effective solutions which will be carried out in the plant itself. Most of the industries will probably go to changes in their processes, uh, changes in the way they manufacture things, and uh, will achieve substantial savings in the long run if they put their plant uh, into good order and follow good housekeeping practices. Many argue with Administrator Dominic's $10 billion figure on municipal costs. They estimate the cost to be closer to between 33 and $37 billion. But Director Jensen says... I always get a little bit concerned when I talk about cost because one can talk about either capital cost or you can talk about the cost of the individual that uh, really is using uh, the sewer system as a public utility. I think when one looks at it as a public utility compared with what you pay for electricity for telephones, the cost really is insignificant. It might amount to uh, for a very, very high level of treatment, perhaps a couple of cents per person per day, which is less than we pay for telephones, light, water, trash removal, all of the other necessary public utilities in an urban area. In terms of electrical costs, uh, the increase in the price of electricity because of using cooling towers, it probably is in the nature of a 1% increase in cost. In terms of product costs from uh, industry, generally it's, it's very hard to say. Rather frequently, industry has found that they gain in the products that they can salvage from their waste streams, and we've seen this in the packing industry and the poultry industry as a couple of cases in point. And this may all be true, but environmentalists point out that each year our water quality seems to continue to go down and our pollutants up, despite governmental optimism. Lawyers such as Dave Hawkins of the Stern Community Law Firm in Washington point out that concern for our fresh waters is not new. 
The Refuse Act of 1899 prohibited the discharge of any material into the navigable waters of the United States. There is an exception for municipal sewage. However, it does apply to all industrial waste discharges. This means that any industry which is dumping its waste into the navigable waters of the United States is in violation of the law unless it has applied to the Army Corps of Engineers and received a permit, and very few have done this. Unfortunately, the position of the Justice Department has been that they will not prosecute what they term consistent polluters, but they will prosecute those who are polluting on a non-scheduled basis. The impact of this is to leave the largest polluters alone, those who, in effect, pollution is a necessary uh, concomitant of their operation. They cannot operate without polluting. Those, in effect, are being left alone by these Justice Department guidelines, whereas the small riverside plant operator who happens to perhaps dump waste in accidentally uh, several times a year is going to be the person that they will go after. Of course, the political ease of implementation of this type of a guideline is clear to be seen. Uh, one avoids offending the most powerful interest and yet accumulates a record for tough enforcement of a law. However, a group of public interest lawyers are trying to do something about this. One of the provisions in the Refuse Act of 1899 states that anyone who informs the government of a violation may collect as a reward one half of the fine. And there is an ancient theory of English law that uh, statutes which contain that type of a reward provision show a strong intention that the law be enforced and even allow the informer to go into court and to institute the action both in the name of the state and himself in order to collect the reward which is due to him. Now, this is being tried in a number of places, and it's yet to be seen whether the court will uphold that argument. But if it does, it means that any concerned citizen in the United States, when he is aware of an industrial polluter, may gather the evidence, present it to the local or federal attorney. If the local federal attorney fails or refuses to act, he may then go with the evidence right into court and ask that the polluter be prosecuted and that uh, his pollution be halted in his own name as well as in the name of the state. Of course, this would be a remarkably effective way to enforce this very old uh, 1899 law. Many concerned citizens are finding that they can fight pollution and polluters. Mrs. Jean Packard is a housewife. She's also a member of organizations interested in the environment, especially in the environment in and around her home in Fairfax County, Virginia. We've had a very serious sewer problem in Fairfax County that was brought out by our Federation of Citizens Association, which is about 150 groups within the county that are banded together in a federation. We had discovered terrible overloadings of our local sewage treatment plant. We called this to the attention of our elected officials who said they had not been aware of the problem at all. Unfortunately, they didn't pay much attention to us, so we took it to the state. And here we were a bunch of citizens operating completely as individual citizens. The state blew the whistle on the county, and we were able for a limited time to have a complete moratorium on all development in Fairfax County. And this is one of the fastest growing counties in the entire United States. Land development building is our major industry. We were able to get it stopped until actions were taken to improve our sewage treatment capacity. So you see, individual citizens have found that if they are willing to spend the time, money, and effort needed, something can be done to stop what somebody called the rape of our rivers. Day by day, our governments, state, city, and federal are doing more to crack down on polluters, and even tougher federal laws seem to be coming into view. Despite industry spokesmen's arguments that water pollution should be treated only as a local problem. Environmentalists agree that water pollution needs local attention, but with the backing of strong federal forces. And if you want to know what you can do on a local level, contact the U.S. Office of Water Quality 
Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20460. Our next report will be on salt water, the oceans, and man. Produced by Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, with Dr. Harry Shapiro of the American Museum of Natural History as consultant. Can Man Survive is written and produced by Walter McGraw. Bill Kalin is the executive producer. I'm Gary Moore.